Uh, so I'm Alice, I'm a senior lecturer for those of you that uh, are in the US, that's an associate professor at the University of Sheffield, where I'm also a future leader fellow. And a lot of my research to date has focused on imaging DNA at high resolution. And we've worked really closely with Brooker to try and develop techniques that allow us to see the double helix of DNA and see the ultrastructure of DNA. And we've done a lot of work to try and actually improve the AFM itself. So working really closely with feed and treaching, looking at how we can use peak force tapping to make high resolution imaging easier and more uh, more achievable. Um, and then also we've worked really closely with uh, Brooker to develop cantilevers that mean that this is much more reproducible. So quite a few papers have shown by now that AFM imaging changes um, with the tip. So our resolution is in part dependent on the size of our tip. Um, so we worked really closely with Brooker to, to develop these probes called the Peak Force High Res Vs, super catchy name. Um, which are able to actually image the double helix of DNA really reliably. So we found for our research that it's been really important to be able to do our research using commercial equipment so that we can focus on answering um, fundamental biological or biochemical questions using the AFM itself, taking advantage of this new resolution we're able to get. Um, so it was back in 2014 that we first worked with Brooker to show that we could see the double helix of DNA on a single molecule of DNA in solution, um, and that we could actually see variations in this double helical structure of DNA. And this was done on the FAST scan, um, which Beat's been talking about quite a bit today. Um, and what we actually were able to see is that we could see variations in this ultrastructure of DNA that's only two nanometers wide and high and has a periodicity of about one nanometer. So we looked at it expecting it to be like a little nano ruler that would tell us how good our probes were, how good our peak force tapping was. But actually when we looked at this length scale, we could see more than we expected to. So the pink and blue overlay is just the crystal structure before anyone gets super excited. And already here we can see this width difference that we get in AFM that we all are aware of where we have this tip convolution and it's not something we can get away from. I mean, we showed in this paper that we can deconvolute it, but I think the interesting thing that we often don't talk about or think about is that we don't often deconvolute this in AFM. We take it as, as read that we have this convolution of the tip and the sample and then we move on. So this is kind of an open part of this and, and especially as I'm leading into the question, should we be deconvoluting our data more? Should we be doing more to try and think about what the effect of the tip is and whether we can take that out? So what we found was that by working with these probes that had a really defined tip radius, so these probes have a one to two nanometer tip radius that we were able to continually get really high resolution imaging of DNA. So these are two different types of molecules chosen because they have slightly different lengths. And what we could see was we were able to image the double helix of DNA all the way around it. Now, for those of you that don't know, that's super exciting because it's such a small thing to be able to see. This means we can image a one nanometer periodicity on a flexible molecule. But that flexibility, the fact that DNA is not only corrugated, it not only has this ultra structure, but that it's flexible means that its substructure and its higher order structure both change. So I've put a bit of a pun in the title here, but the flexibility of DNA, the inherent bendiness of DNA that gives it its mechanical properties and means that it performs a useful job in the cell, makes it really challenging to analyze. So what I'm showing on the top line here is AFM images taken of a range of different molecules. And at the bottom, molecular dynamic simulations, which show striking similarity in structure. And we thought that was really exciting. But what we wanted to do was try and integrate those two pieces of information closer together. And I think, again, this is something that we often don't do enough in AFM is correlating our measurements. It works so nicely with other techniques, but we don't have the computational tools to integrate the structure here that we have from the molecular dynamic simulations into the AFM. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this is because within the MD simulation, we have chemistry. We know where all of our, AFM, where all of our atoms are, whereas in AFM, we miss that chemistry. So we set about saying, how can we go from just comparing two pictures 
a picture from an MD simulation and a picture from an AFM to actually quantifying what's happening to the structure within. So I'm going to give an overview of both what our research does, but also our motivation for doing this here quickly. So as I talked about in the first part of this, is we think it's really important to, to be able to perform high resolution AFM, but that, that high resolution AFM is accessible, so that this is possible on commercially available systems, and that this is possible to do for anyone that wants to look at any problem. Um, so we've worked really closely with brokers, I've talked about it a little bit, but also something that we do through my lab, I'm part of the Henry Royce Institute, and this is a UK-wide uh, research institute that means that we run as a facility. So we're able to do AFM with collaborators, for collaborators, and we're able to provide people access to really high resolution instruments within this large scale facility. And we have the ability to get funding for that as well. And I think it's really important that people are able to do AFM in a way that supports them to be able to take really high resolution data. As Dahlia has just talked about, we get lots of artifacts in AFM. We know that, probably most of the people on this call know that, but we still see huge amounts of artifacts in the data. And we can try and compensate for them later, but we can also try and avoid them happening um, by taking really high resolution data in the first place. But once we have that data, what do we do with it? So we believe that one of the most important ways to do this is to develop open image analysis pipelines. So the really important part of that is that everything we do is open. So you can find everything we do on GitHub. Um, there's a QR code here. If you're on a mobile phone, you can scan it. You can go straight to our um, GitHub page. But we think it's really important to have these quantitative image pipe analysis pipelines. So we move from being just pictures to actually quantitative substantive data. And only once we've done that can we address things like fundamental unsolved research questions. Ours, for example, is understanding the effect of molecular structure on DNA interactions, as Andrea so nicely introduced at the start. And one of my big motivations for doing this is talking about making our data more available. There's so much rich data that we have within our images that we often miss. We have so much more data than we can look at, than we can understand, and we're still developing the tools to probe this. So we all need to work on making our data and our code available so that we can start processing these huge amounts of data. As everyone's talked about today, a limiting factor for doing machine learning on AFM is that it's a slow technique, it's slow to acquire data. So we all need to make all of our data, our training data, our uh, software available so that we can grow our community of AFM. So if you're already working in AFM and you're writing some code on your laptop and you want to be part of this big movement to developing, to developing and growing our community, We've developed somewhere on, um, on GitHub where we can really kind of make our software known. So we've developed an AFM software list. You can go to this link and you can fill out an issue and we'll upload your soft, a link to your software onto this page. Because what we want to do is make it easier for people to find pieces of software that are useful for them. Um, and that they're able to then use it, they're able to adapt it, they can do that under all the different licenses that they have um, and they can use and develop software together to grow our community rather than focusing on individual efforts. I think if we work together, we can actually make a big movement forwards for our field. So what do we do? Well, we're interested in developing a pre-processing pipeline that means that all AFM images are processed perfectly. So I have this vision that one day we'll never see poorly flattened AFM images in the literature again. And so what I did was I actually went back to the raw data from the paper I've just showed you, and I downloaded one of the images from our repository. And I tried putting it through our pipeline without any flattening, and it doesn't work. Because pre-processing is essential. If you try and pick out individual molecular information from raw AFM images, the thing you will mainly pick out is the tilt of your sample and the line-to-line -line variation. Those are the biggest patterns that any pattern recognition algorithm can recognize are the tilt of the sample or the striping of the sample because of the line-to-line -line scanning errors or because of the tilt of your sample. So to try and compensate for this, we developed TopoStats in order to pre-process all data because I think we've all used things like Fiji or ImageJ or different macros to analyze our data. But we wanted to be able to take in the huge amounts of data that you're able to get as we image faster and faster and pull in all of that information into one pipeline and 
analyze it in one place, no more hand processing, export as 